Good day, Carl. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Well, thank you for inviting me, Guy. You know, I think it's fantastic that you're doing all these videos. This is, and it's also fun. So thanks a lot. You're most welcome. So this is our second video. We did the first one back in 2010. So here we are a decade later uh, during the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but let's start with, uh, for our audience, would you please introduce yourself and uh, uh, tell us you know, a little bit about yourself? Well, my name is Carl Binder, and I'm CEO of a company called the Performance Thinking Network. And I've been doing performance consulting in one form or other for about 40 years. And uh, we now work with companies around the world, actually, uh, to help improve performance. Very cool. Thank you. So can you tell us a little bit? Of, so where did you grow up? I grew up in Seattle, Washington, and uh, I lived there until I was 20. I uh, went to good Catholic elementary school and Jesuit high school that prepared me well. I was a state debate champion in uh, high school, which made changed my career, made me more or less fearless speaking in front of people, which is apparently an important thing these days. And uh, then I went to Seattle University, and which is another Jesuit institution in Seattle. I went to college there. And I graduated in three years with a philosophy major. I took a lot of courses. And I also took this, was in this thing called the uh, honors program. It was a great books program for two years where we studied essentially Western and a little bit of Eastern culture from several thousand years ago to the present moment where we were studying history, sort of thought, which include philosophy and, and such and, uh, and literature, which was a huge kind of liberal arts, critical thinking background. But I was interested in philosophy because I thought I wanted, I had some great philosophy professors and I wanted to develop, they helped me think and I wanted to help young people think. And then I discovered uh, B.F. Skinner's work by, by reading Walden II and that kind of changed my life. And then, you know, proceeded from there, was a philosophy doctoral student for a year and then through a whole insane set of good fortune wound up being Skinner student at Harvard. And that kind of started my career. Tell us a little bit about that story. I've heard this before, so I'd like to capture this and share it with others. <laughs> well, well, I was, I think I was a sophomore at Seattle U, if I remember. And I was assigned to read this book, Walden Two, which was Skinner's novel about a utopian community based on behavior science principles. And I didn't know anything about Skinner or whatever, but I read the book and it, initially, actually, I read the book and I was appalled because this was the 60s. And it's like, wait a minute, this is mind control. And I had all these preconceptions about what behavior science was about. And then I had a professor who was, uh, well, actually, her, his wife, who was getting a PhD in behavior therapy at the University of Washington. And I don't know what she said to me, but whatever it was, she said, you should reread that. So I reread the book and I had this huge thing, which was, oh, my God, all he's saying is if we apply the principles of natural science and the methods of natural science to our own behavior, we can improve, you know, education, training, management, you name it. So I got really excited and I wrote Dr. Skinner a fan letter. I kind of looked, I don't know how I found out even where to send it because we didn't have the internet those days. But anyway, I sent him this fan letter, just telling him how excited I was and how profoundly this has affected me and all that. Well, surprise, surprise, two weeks later, I get a letter back from him which I still have on my wall, actually. But he basically said, well, sounds like you're already signed up to go to graduate school and you should go to your doctoral program anyway. But if you're still interested, you know, keep in touch. And one of the best things in the letter was he said, maybe we can find a place where you can do graduate study without too much of a waste of time, which I subsequently realized he had no tolerance for academic politics. And so I, that was kind of a pre-shadow of that. But anyway, so I went to Notre Dame for a year and I was a doctoral student there in philosophy, but I initially, I realized really quickly that I did not want to spend the rest of my career on some minute bit of philosophy, kind of making stuff up and publishing and so forth. So I transferred into experimental psychology, which was not at all a Skinnerian behavior science kind of program. It was very much more traditional learning theory kind of program. And so I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I applied to another place, University of Iowa, and uh, got into a doctoral program there. But in the meantime, a friend of mine at Notre Dame, um, his family lived in the Boston area. So that July, 
I got a ride to uh, Boston with him and I found Skinner's office. I mean, I had long hair. I was like a hippie graduate student, you know. I walk in on his office. I knock his door and he was there. And he remembered me from my letters, or at least he said he did, or my letter. So he sat me down for an hour. And at the end of an hour, it was a really wonderful conversation. He said, well, have you ever thought about applying here at Harvard? And I said, not really. You know, it's kind of above my whatever. And so he, so he proceeded to introduce me to the other professors there. And he said, you should apply. So I applied, this was July, and they let me in for that September in the doctoral program in experimental psychology. I think I had some good recommendations, I think mostly on the basis of my test scores, honestly, but, uh, and the fact that he was kind of a sponsor at that point. And then I wound up studying there for several years. Uh, he was semi-retired, but um, I took independent study courses with him for a couple of years and read his book, Verbal Behavior, and helped him edit about behaviorism, which he was, the book he was working on at the time. And sort of got to know him and that anyway that was one of these i mean there's actually even a better story if you want it which is that i had no money personally i was i came from a fairly poor family i went there i had a full ride to the university of iowa so i don't know if you can imagine but my family thought i was nuts go to iowa full ride you know fellowship go to harvard no money but for me it was like bf skinner or you know whatever the cornfields of iowa so i didn't have to me, it was no option. So I showed up, I, 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 I packed all my stuff up in Indiana. I took Greyhound bus to Boston. I uh, put my stuff in a locker at the uh, Greyhound terminal because I didn't know what I was going to do. I'd met this woman on the bus who said, oh, you should call me when you get into town. Maybe, you know, we can get together, whatever. So I, I take, I take the, the, uh, the, tr the subway into Harvard Square. In those days, I was rolling my own cigarettes. And uh, so I'm sitting in Harvard Square, long hair, the whole deal. I didn't really know what I was going to do. So I'm just sitting there having a cigarette. And this very blue, literally blue collar guy walks by and he says, hey, traveler, you know, you look kind of interesting. So he strikes up a conversation with me and tells me he's got two daughters and da 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 da, -da And he's going to go, he's just finishing up work. So he, he's going to go in and have a beer. And I, so he said, what, you know, where are you staying? I said, well, I'm not sure. There's this girl who said I could call her. He says, well, good luck, you know. So he goes into the bit bar. So I go over and use pay phone. And there was no answer on the phone for this woman who'd said, check, check. So I'm back sitting there not knowing what to do. And the guy comes back. He says, well, how would it work out? I said, I don't know, man. I don't know. So he said, why don't you come home from, with me? So oh, really? So, okay. So he takes me on the train to his very nice home in Arlington, Massachusetts. And feeds me and, you know, nice dinner with his family. And I, later I discovered, I think maybe he was interested in like this Harvard guy for his daughters or something. I don't know. But anyway, next day I go back to the Harvard Square. I got a job washing cars at Brody Auto, uh, auto Rental, which was a little private auto rental place. And I got, um, I think I had a loan. I think I got a student loan maybe to cover something. I don't remember. And I got an $11 a week room in a rooming house for that like had a lot of cockroaches but it was within walking distance of the psych building so at harvard they have this first week they call at least they did then i don't know now called reading period and you can go and check out classes and not have to sign up for them so i went and checked out this class by this guy named nelson goodman who was an old almost like 19th century philosophy guy and he was teaching a course on philosophy and psychology so I thought, oh, that looks interesting. So I'm sitting there and at the end of the class, he says, geez, there's a lot more students here than I, than I thought there was gonna be. I'm gonna need a teaching fellow. So I like go screaming up to the front of the room and said, you know, pick me, pick me. And he did, so then I had tuition covered. And it sort of, it was like one of those deals where you jump off a cliff and it turns out it works out. You know, it was quite an experience. I, this is one of my messages to my to students and younger colleagues is always, you know, follow your heart, man. It'll work out somehow. Go what you go for it, because otherwise you'll never know what you missed. You know. Oh, that's anyway, cool. that's the story. That's very cool. Thank you. Uh, so tell us now, uh, where are you now, and uh, what do you do now? Well, I well I'm in uh, business, but you know, what what kinds of work do you do? Yeah, I'm in. I I, I moved. I was in the Boston area for 26 years. Had a couple of companies there actually. 
moved to the West Coast in California for 10 years, and then about 15 years ago, moved back up to the Seattle area, which is where I'm from, from, except I live in Bainbridge Island now. And Bainbridge is like a half hour ferry boat ride from downtown Boston. And it's about 24,000 people. One of the most highly educated towns in the country, actually. And uh, I moved here just because the real estate prices were a little bit less for a comparable home than in Seattle, and it's a beautiful place in nature. So I moved here about uh, 14 years ago, and we, my partnership consulting firm then sort of morphed into the Performance Thinking Network, which is the company now. And what we do is we, we do some consulting, but mostly what we do is we, we develop other people's, we, we have a certification program called the Performance Thinking Practitioner Program that develops performance consultants, and they they go through a, a 12, it's essentially 24 hours of instruction that's delivered virtually now and then, and then we coach them through a project. So we know they've done at least one project following what we teach them. And then we also have other courses. We have courses, we have programs for coaches and managers. We have a leadership series. We have an emerging set of things for HR business partners. We have an executive coaching uh, methodology now. And so mostly what we do is we teach other people to do this stuff, certify them, whether they're in companies, inside of companies, like Amgen, for example, has something like 260 certified uh, performance, performance thinking practitioners, and, uh, or we certify affiliates to deliver our programs. And so that's how, we, that's how we're trying to scale to get to more people. So I spent a lot of time coaching other people through application to this stuff. Very, very cool. Well, let's go back to uh, your early career then, and let's talk about some of the uh, more interesting things that you have done, because I know it's a, a very rich story. You've had several com uh, companies, but uh, mm -hmm. break away from academia and get into the uh, corporate world. Well, after what ha the way that happened was um, when I, I studied with Skinner, but I didn't really want to, he didn't have a lab anymore. And the lab that was at Harvard was not interesting to me. It was R.J. Herrnstein's matching law stuff mostly, and I wasn't very interested in it. And so Skinner introduced me to some people who introduced me to some people who got me a job for 10 years working with a woman named B.H. Barrett, Beatrice Barrett. And she was a pioneer in the application of really hardcore Skinnerian operant conditioning to, to both laboratory study, but also instructional design for people who were then called politically correctly, mentally retarded. Uh, now we wouldn't use that phrase, but they lived in an institution near, near, near Cambridge uh, called the Fernal State School. And I worked there for 10 years. And during that period, I became an early, I, 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 I got some additional mentors. Ogden Lindsley, who had been a, who had been a postdoc with, uh, oh, had been a PhD with Skinner and B. Barrett had been a postdoc with them. And then Eric Houghton, who was one of his students, they become sort of my mentors. And I became an early participant in a field called precision teaching, where instead of just looking at accurate performance, you actually time, when you assess and practice, you look at how many responses per minute somebody can do, because that's Skinner's measure, his rate of response measure. So we took Skinner's measurement into classroom settings, and we did some really pretty revolutionary work in building what we subsequently call fluency, behavioral fluency in all kinds of stuff, but this was with vocational, self-care, fairly foundational academic and personal skills. And so I spent about 10 years doing that and becoming kind of a small time thought leader in that field. I would train teachers and consult to schools around the country and we were doing some pretty cool stuff. And, uh, but Lindsley, who had bigger ideas, in about 1978, he said, I want you to take what we've learned into the corporate world. So I didn't have any idea what that was about, but our la the support for our laboratory work was starting to dissolve a little bit anyway, because there was politics around it. So I, I left the lab in 82. Well, about, uh, yeah, 82. And I started my first company, which was called Precision Teaching and Management Systems. It was just me. And I was really a solution set in, in, in search of a problem. And so that's when I learned about ISPI. They, we had a local chapter in Massachusetts and I became very involved uh, and eventually became president of it and stuff like that. And, but in the meantime, I was talking about behavioral fluency and publishing some stuff about it. And you know that was a new idea for most people. And so what happened was at some point, a guy who was a vice president of a company called Omega Performance Corporation, which was the 
kind of premier training company in banks at the time. And they were, they would train risk management and, and financial assessment and stuff to loan officers and, 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 and so on. And they were pretty global in scope, at least national, but I think outside the country too. And so he said, you know, banks have de been deregulated. Loan officers need to become salespeople now. And so we're developing a sales curriculum, but this, does this fluency stuff apply to product knowledge? I don't know, you know, I didn't really know anything about it. So that's when I first encountered Neil Rackham's work, so I could sort of understand the essentials of what sales was about. And we, and, and I got involved and developed a set of programs with Omega for banks that actually, this was 1980, mid 80s, until five or six years ago, it was still out there, actually, those programs were still out there. And they involved structured reference materials using the information mapping methodology, and fluency based practice timed practice on both small things like facts you need to know but also like responding to questions and objections and so forth and what happened was we developed this program and it just knocked the top off of anything anybody had ever seen we had senior people saying you know i've been selling this stuff for five years and these kids know it better than i do and all that so we published some stuff in ispi's journal uh, well performance improvement the magazine or whatever and then I started getting calls from uh, like Digital Equipment Corporation, high tech companies from Southwest Bell, from, but can you do this for us? So we said, well, maybe. So we started applying the models we developed, which was really an early version of knowledge management plus fluency-based practice and coaching. And um, we started applying that uh, to other kinds of industries. And because a core part of this was the information mapping method, at some point I needed subcontractors who could do that. So I went to information mapping, which was about a $10 million a year company at that point. And I talked to the CEO and to Bob Horn, who was the founder. And I said, well, you got to be my subcontractor. So that went on for about a year and a half. I was this little dinky company. They were a big one relatively. And so at some point we formed a joint venture called Product Knowledge Systems in 92. And in the mid eighties, when I got, when we were starting to implement this fluency based stuff, it, it was very much self-study. So you had to, you know, salespeople had to practice on their own. It, it wasn't in the classroom. You did a little practice every day and you tried to meet certain goals and you know, you can't reach them with the long arm of the instructor or whatever, cause they're not in the class. So I had been introduced to Tom Gilbert's work by Og Linsley and Eric Houghton, who had known him when he was at Harvard and they were collaborators to some extent. And so the, the uh, behavior engineering model really caught my attention because what I said is, wait a minute, we're down here in what Tom called the knowledge box. We're developing fluent knowledge. But if we're gonna get these guys to apply it or even to practice on their own, we gotta look at some of these other variables that the behavior engineering model highlighted. So we initially used uh, that as a kind of an implementation and sort of sustainment model. Um, and I, I got to know Tom at that point because I was then an ISPI and I invited him and Marilyn and his wife up to the workshop in Boston and I you know, got into ISPI. And so that was really my entrance first into the corporate world with the fluency thing and then into the performance improvement world by sort of expanding the scope uh, with Tom Gilbert. And I didn't really fully appreciate his contribution around accomplishments until a little bit later, but that's how the transition happened. If that if that makes sense. No, oh, and then and then we spent ten years at Product Knowledge Systems, working across a whole lot of industries. At one point, uh, I, I I targeted all the advocate companies for ISPI, Microsoft, et cetera, et cetera, to be our our clients. And at one point, we had almost all of them as our clients, and we would work on large. Um, large product launches uh, you know that was a big thing um and uh, then we'd wind up like with genentech working with them for years after that to to do other stuff anyway well, that's so, as far so, as i should go so that point. so how did that then get you into i don't know what, if it was called boxes but uh you went from that now into your yep. current company so what, fill in that gap what happened yeah what happened there was uh, for I and the people on my teams, when we were developing the sales related, sales performance related stuff, 
Tom's model worked fine. We were ner performance nerds. We loved it. But what happened was when we began to try to engage our clients in this and we'd show them the behavior engineering model and it said um, data, um, uh, instruments, incentives, knowledge, capacity, and motives. Some of those cells just didn't make sense to people. They say, what data? What do you mean? Like is this spreadsheets or is this, what do you mean? And what we say, well, it's the information you need to be able to perform well and know how you're doing, you know, or instruments. Is that like an ohm meter or, or <laughs> what is that? So what happened was, and a lot of people did this to, in different ways. Some of our colleagues also, you know, um, um, Roger Chevalier, um, uh, several of our other colleagues started doing this, but I started changing the language in the cells because I wanted to get to the point where people understood it and, and I didn't have to always correct them where they wouldn't make sort of category errors. So it took about four or five years, but we finally came up with this language that we now use. And so I would be presenting it to people and they'd get it or somebody would even stop me on my way out of some consulting engagement and they'd say, hey, can you help me with this? And it was something where I'd say, well, let me just show you this little model and I draw it out and I would use our labels on the cells and they would get it and I would come back weeks later and they say, I've been using that and they were. And so it was kind of a user tested model. We learned that we, could, we had language now that um, people could understand. And I was highly influenced by Steve Jobs earlier because um, Ogden Lindsay was an early adopter of Apple. And so I sort of had in the back of my mind this kind of user testing, user experience, simplicity thing that drove a lot of my career really. And so now we started using that model. But what would happen is I'd get up in front of people and I'd say, well, oh, we have this model and it's really based on Tom Gilbert's model, but you can see the language is different and we use it a little bit differently and uh, I don't know what to call it exactly. And at some point, a guy named Tom Hogan was a very wily uh, sale, VP of sales training, used to be a sales guy. And he was actually one of the earlier, earliest trainers with uh, Rackham Spin Selling actually. But anyway, uh, Tom was in the back of the room when I was stumbling over myself one day. He said, why don't you just call it the six boxes? You're always referring to those boxes. So I said, oh, okay. So we started doing that. And so that emerged. And so then I started presenting at ISPI in places and I would talk about it as the six boxes. And that, that emerged and was used pretty heavily during the product knowledge system era where we were going into companies, looking at sales performance, trying to build performance systems to enable salespeople. And then what happened was when I left product knowledge systems in um, 1997, I moved from uh, the Boston area to Santa Rosa, California to join my soon to become wife, uh, Cynthia Ria, and uh, now ex-wife, but anyway. Um, and we formed a company called Binder Ria Associates. And what we were trying to do is take what we, the fluency building work, as well as a little bit the six boxes, but mostly the fluency building work and train other people how to do it. And so then what would happen is we went into, we got into customer service and this was late nineties and got involved in a lot of call centers like at t Wireless, Amazon and so forth. And we would go in and work with their instructional designers to teach them how to create fluency based instructional and, and, and practice activities. And, you know, for example, at Amazon, they never gave me the data because they're a very secretive company, but they said it more than improved their productivity in their call centers by 25%. Uh, we had um, at at t Wireless, you know, we took them from having to onboard new customer service reps and it taking two months for them to get up to benchmark. It took only two weeks with our approach and then uh, they, they knocked the top off of that and beat the benchmark by 60%. So, so we started teaching people how to do this work but the problem with the fluency building stuff is that it looks way different than conventional training. It looks like a learning gym and it's loud and active and all that. And so we would help these designers and developers, you know, create these programs. But then when we left, it would kind of fade back to the way it used to be more or less. It was sort of death by PowerPoint plus a few practice activities. So I decided that, so I decided that was not, you know, I didn't, I could make money from it, but I, it wasn't going to have an impact. So at that point, the six boxes was sort of part of our thing. And what I realized was the plain English system of it was a big deal. And so in the 
early 2000s, my partner and I looked at this and we said, wait a minute, performance improvement as it is currently taught is really complicated. At least it comes off as that. And leaders and managers, uh, you know, often say, this looks like analysis paralysis, you know, and, um, and our, even a lot of our colleagues in ISPI would point to the ISPI model, for example, and they'd say, well, we've been trying to do that, but it's really complicated. And so we realized we had an opportunity, which is really what evolved into what I have now, which is to take very plain English framework, because, then, because I also, Joe Harless was an enormous impact on me. You know, because I met him through ISPI and I, he became my friend and mentor over quite a few years. And he really taught me the value of accomplishments, of why we should be accomplishment based. And so we then developed this plain English thing called the performance chain, which is our other model. And so, so what happened was we basically got to a point where about 10, 12 years ago, we started developing programs to teach other people how to do this. And, and one of the differentiators is that it's plain English. So very quickly your clients or your stakeholders can get it and become really active participants. And then the other thing we started to learn is we could teach managers how to coach. We could teach leaders how to do execution of strategic plans and process management. We could, we could do certain kind of uh, uh, executive coaching with executives. We could develop HR business partners. So we, we came up with this kind of generalizable method, set of models that of course the vision is, you know, cover the organization in performance thinking. So, and then that's one other part I may as well finish, which is um, some of our earlier clients for these programs, for example, Amera Group at that time, which now is a part of Anthem, it's like 10 years ago or so, they would say, you know, you're teaching us a methodology here, but what you're really teaching is just to think differently about performance through these kind of models. So we started using the phrase performance thinking, and then we realized that that was bigger and more important than the six boxes model because it was the whole thing. It was, it was looking at accomplishments, et cetera, too. So we kind of shifted from binder reassociates. We did business as the performance thinking network, and then now we're an LLC, but now we're really teach performance thinking is the way we, you know, trademark it or whatever you want to say. Yeah, very. That's cool. a long story, but that's no, that's no, how it that's, all emerged. Well, that's that's what I was looking for here because I've, you know, I've known you since the early '80s. I mean, joined ISP myself at the, in '79, and uh, um, but uh, so let's uh, shift slightly here. So, when did you first? Uh, you've got a long history in all of this, and the going back to Skinner, who many consider to be kind of really the father or grandfather of HPT versus, you know, Tom Gilbert being the father of HPT. Um, but what was your, what was your first exposure to or your first aha moment where you discovered this, you know, evidence-based practices for performance improvement or however you refer to it? And, and how do you refer to this thing, HPT, human performance technology? Well, that's a good question. So I think the first big aha was the behavior engineering model. And because, you know, I grew up with Skinner and with research based on Skinner and that, and that technically Skinner's model is the so-called three-term contingency. Discriminative stimuli or antecedents that set the occasion for behavior that are followed by consequences. So that was a tool we used for years. But Gilbert's big insight in my opinion, was that he recognized Skinner's model and the model that a lot of performance management people still use in organizational behavior management was really came out of a laboratory where all of the learners were assumed to be the same. They were rats and pigeons and dogs and sometimes people, but the assumption was there was, you know, we starved them to 80% body weight, so food was a reinforcer. We knew the consequences. We knew what they could see or smell. We knew what the stim. So we didn't have to take individuals into account. But what Tom's big idea was is that bottom row, in, at least with respect to the behavior engineering model, is that individuals bring different degrees of skills and knowledge to the table. They, they have different, you know, you got to be tall enough to be a basketball player. You know, you got to be strong, whatever it is. You got to be analytical or social. You have these characteristics that he described as capacity, which we eventually wound up describing as selection and assignment, because those are the characteristics of people that you match to the jobs. And that also motives and preferences are huge because you can give people an incentive and they don't care if, they, if they're not motivated by that thing. So that was the first thing, realize, oh, we have to look at the individuals involved. 
And then the notion that we have to look at the whole system of how these things work together. So that was a huge aha. And then, then as I, as I got into that, I started out at the ISPI world with sort of fluency based instruction and coaching plus behavior engineering model. But then as I came under the influence of, of, uh, of Joe Harless, who was a brilliant packager and communicator of what I think for Gilbert was more philosophy than it was technology. I think his, his big statement that, you know, in the great cult of behavior, people think of behavior for its own sake is valuable, but really it's the products of behavior accomplishments. So I made contact with that in Gilbert's book and I sort of understood it, but I didn't have a way to deal with it very well. And so, so first, so um, Joe Harless taught me a few things. One is, how to take something and make it into a product that you can then train a whole lot of people like get hundreds of people at Boeing doing instructional design the same way or whatever it is. Um, but he also, you know, he focused on accomplishment based curriculum development, accomplishment based this or that. So that was the next aha. But, but I've added something to that a little bit because what I also observed, both among my behaviorist colleagues, many of whom are Gilbert fans, you know, the organizational behavior management people, and also frankly at ISPI, was that the word accomplishment was used in very different ways by different people. So some people it meant a change in business results or societal results. Sometimes it meant just a change in behavior. So some of the folks like Brethauer and, and, uh, and Rumler, for example, they would do things like organizational relationship maps or systems maps of things where the accomplishments were passive verbs. They were like procedure completed. And I was like, well, wait a minute, what did the procedure produce? So a big insight that I had at some point was we need to be sure that accomplishments are things. And the best way to do, one of the best ways to do that is to say they're countable. So for example, information to me is not a very useful way to decide that accomplishment, a report or a data set or a spreadsheet or whatever, that's a thing and we can tell what a good one is and we can figure out what it takes to produce it. So kind of discovered in my own trying to, which is that if you're really clear that an accomplishment is a thing and it's a countable thing that is the product of behavior, you get caught up in a soup. And so that, that, and so in all of that, because I was, because ISPI was very good to me, you know, I showed up a little later than you did in the early to mid eighties and I'll never, forget Margot Murray was the president then and she welcomed me with incredible open arms she was a wonderful person to be leading that organization at the time and of course when I said I was a student with Skinner it raised my kind of whatever credibility because I was kind of a kid I was pretty young but all of a sudden it's like ooh. so I became sort of a junior micro thought leader or whatever so that meant I could and also I'm aggressive about people that I want to know, learn from. So I got to know people and I got to know um, Joe Harless pretty well. And so he was a huge uh, influencer on all that. And I always referred to it as human performance technology because that's what we called it at ISPI. But then when the folks kind of cloned HPT and turned it into human performance improvement for a, a, what was then ASTD, and they, they're a way better marketing organization, right? So they realized human performance improvement was a lot better term than human performance technology. So now when I talk about this stuff, I say, well, there's the APD version, there's the ISPI version, but we call our thing performance thinking. So I just say performance thinking is a particular methodology instead of models for performance improvement, organizational or individual performance improvement, but it has certain characteristics that I'll you know, tell you about in detail if you want to hear. Well, no, very, no, I, I agree. And, uh, so the whole thing about uh, countable, yeah, I, I would refer to it as physical and kickable, uh, as I mm -hmm. describe worthy outputs, borrowing Tom Gilbert's phrase of worthy outputs. Because, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, that's it, that you made that interesting point about Brethauer and Rumler, and I, I didn't like the way they phrased those, you know, the, the noun verb and, you the, know. The passive verb thing, yeah. My my clients hated that, <laughs> so I should. Is that right? Quickly, because my clients did not like to hear that kind of a pattern. I I said, well, what do you call it? And I just you know, as, as Jim Hill might have might say or has been saying for decades, 
you know, what do you want to call it? Or what do you call it? And I just used their yeah. language. And, and so I had to avoid using the phrase accomplishments because people had nuanced definitions of what that meant. And they didn't always agree. It's true. It variance across. That's right. So I kind of left that um, a long time ago. But uh, no, thank you for all of that. Well, story. we, and, and that's why we created our own phrase for it. We call it work outputs. Because mm -hmm. you can, you know, other people are going to use this word accomplishments in lots of ways. And I use that as a synonym, just like I use words like, like contributions. I mean, there's a bunch of nouns you can use to describe these things. But to me, work outputs is a good phrase, A, because other people don't use those two words together right. typically. And secondly, an output does sound like something you can count, you know, mm -hmm. so that people can get that pretty fast usually that, that just reminds me of in 81 i was working at motorola and my clients uh manufacturing folks i use the word exemplar and they stopped me and said guy we hate that word it's a three dollar college now today it'd be a thirty dollar college word but i said how about master performers i was just reaching for something and they said yeah, yeah. Can. so you know but and again there's you know a whole bunch of language that's it's one of the things that used to drive Harless crazy, I think, is that we had so much variance in language, <laughs> uh, which, made, which makes it difficult for new people coming in. I, I always you know, have I empathy for the new people coming in, trying to figure out the, the models and the language, and you can layer principles right. to that thing, and uh, it's just difficult. So that, but that's a kind of a well, good segue, segue if we can. Um, and I wanted to ask about some of your, your biggest influences. Now you've already mentioned them, but what, is, what I'm looking for here is for our audience and people that are maybe coming into the field, what would you point, what would you point them to people wise, article wise, book wise, things that, that you know, might help them uh, climbing the learning curve here in this world. Well, I say I have a lot of colleagues who come from still the behavior science, behavior analysis world into this field, usually through what's called organizational behavior management. Yeah. And I think that they need to make more contact with essentially the philosophy that Tom Gilbert talks about in human confidence. I don't go back to that book much anymore, but my original copy of it is so dog-eared and marked up it's ridiculous because there's more ideas in there than you can apply. And I don't apply all of them at all. But for example, the notion of exemplary performer or stars, I call them, uh, or uh, you know, the, the behavior engineering model, although I prefer the six boxes model because it communicates better and the, the focus on accomplishments, et cetera. I think that's a good book to read but I don't think it's exactly an actionable book in some ways. I think, I think it has a lot of good things in it. And I know people who've done fantastic work with it. But anyway, that's one thing. I think it's, it's a double-edged sword about Skinner because for years he was the devil in some people's view because, you know, I don't know, they thought like I did when I first encountered his work that he thought humans were robots or something, which is not true. But I think, you know, if you want a good introduction to behavior analysis without a lot of you know technical detail his book about behaviorism is pretty darn good and there was a few other things like that and there's a bs skinner foundation which is a great place to become aware of because a lot of his books are available free there and stuff i think unfortunately joe harless didn't write publish that much his little book an ounce of analysis i don't even know if you can still get it and i really think it was even outdated by the time he left us, because he'd sort of gone beyond that in a lot of ways. I think Gary Rumler's work is profoundly important, partly because it really, if not the, was one of the most important contributors to quality process, all the thing that happened in the late eight, you know, 80s and so forth. I don't almost ever get a chance to do things at the enterprise level that he was doing. I'm usually working, you know, my joke is I'm usually working with a sales organization or somebody else. I don't get to talk to Bill Gates, but the effect of that is that I'm usually working at the process or sort of org small sub organization level, except for, so, but I still think Geary's work is brilliant. And I actually think the, the books that they published shortly after he died, the white space revisited is a really good book just to get under your belt, whether you do that work or not. I just think it's a core thing. Um, I learned a lot from Don Toasty, and I mostly learned from Toasty personally, but his, 
we have a kind of a unique approach to cultural work on culture. And the, one of the predecessors of that was Don, Don, uh, Don Toasty and Stephanie Jackson's work on uh, organizational alignment. And there's some stuff, if you look up Don Toasty, you can find his articles and such. Um, Roger Kaufman, even though I was never his student, he's been my friend for years. And Roger's done some brilliant stuff, um, but mostly the whole notion of having goals and needs that are related to societal benefit, mega, is something that he always reminds us of, and it's a very important point. Um, and the other thing about Roger is I think he did a deal with the devil. I think he's going to be around forever. He's still making all these fantastic contributions and writing things, and et cetera, et cetera. So he's an important person to, 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 to learn from. Um, you know, Ogden Lindsley, uh, even though his work is more related to education or basic research is important. Now, I have a not-for-profit website called fluency.org. And on that website, it's mostly was started about uh, 15 years ago for educators, but it has almost all of Ogden Lindsley's basic research stuff on it, as well as everything else he published. And it has a lot of other things about, uh, about uh, by Eric Houghton, who was another person who didn't publish it as much as I wish, but made some really important contributions to curriculum design, the notion applying fluency to component analysis in instructional design. Um, who are some of the other folks? Um, those are, those are the big ones that I think of. Oh, another really important person, Robert E. Horn. Uh, Bob, I met first in about 1986 when I first started doing business with Information Mapping Incorporated. And by that time, he brought on a CEO and was just kind of chairman. And Bob is still my friend. He, he, we keep in touch. Bob is one of those extremely extraordinary geniuses who has created probably seven things that are different and profound. The information mapping method was really, I think, the emergence of structured writing in a systematic way. Unfortunately, I'm actually trying to develop some of my team members to do information mapping now, but the company that acquired his company in Belgium, they're much more of, they just sell sort of template software than they, I think. But anyway, Bob was important as an influence in a lot of ways about around structured writing. How do you make written materials actually usable and accessible for your audience? So for example, at Product Knowledge Systems, it was one of our core technologies because what we would do is um, literally, and this is pre-internet to some extent, take literally boxes full of three ring binders and brochures and sales training materials and PowerPoints and you name it, and we'd boil it down to the stuff that salespeople actually needed to know and we would create an information map document set that was really easy to find stuff in. And then we would build practice activities on top of the things that they actually needed to be fluent about. And it was a powerful thing. And I learned a lot about making the right information accessible from, from Bob. You can, if you Google Bob Horn, you'll find his Stanford website that has links to all the amazing stuff he's done over the years. So he's another important one. Those are the big ones probably that I can think of. Thank you. Yes, I, and I did a, one of these videos with Bob Horn a couple of years ago, but uh, I've been a fan of his since my days at Roll, I guess, when I came across information mapping and I've used some sort of a bastardized version of it uh, since, but uh, not as well as I probably should have mastered. Well, and Bob is another one of those people. I mean, he's, I forget how old he is, but he's in his eighties now. And he's still like consulting to international groups on climate change issues and stuff like that. I mean, this guy has the capacity to tear apart complex, we would call messy problems and uh, clarify them. And he's still, he's still doing it, man. It's yeah, he's calling it wicked problems. And uh, yeah, it's very, it's very cool. Um, so let's, uh, let's shift gears again here. So if you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech, again, we're trying to provide examples to people, but if you were to try uh, give us a 30 second elevator speech on what you do, how, how do you articulate that? Well, we bring into organizations what I would call a plain English user tested set of models that are very simple, have 21 plain English words. And we, using that language, and those models, we teach performance consultants, managers, leaders, uh, executive coaches, HR business partners, and anybody else, even individuals, 
how to participate in the process of continuously improving performance. And that may be big, hairy projects, or it may be simple coaching somebody about some accomplishment we'd like to help them improve. But what, what we do now is we bring what we call performance thinking into organizations and then drive it in as many different directions as we can. So it becomes a shared framework. Thank you for that example. As a lifelong learner, can you share with us uh, any current focus or near term future focus for your own learning? Well, um, I'm learning a lot about social networking and marketing. I've always, you know, ever since, ever since I encountered uh, Neil Rackham's work in spin selling and got to know him a little bit and work with him a little bit. I've seen, I, I, you know, what we did at Product Knowledge Systems was, sh was shifted uh, product knowledge, so-called, from features and benefits to needs and solutions, which, which is not only a better way to train uh, salespeople, but it also changes your mindset, to use the current language, about how you think about stuff. And so I'm a little bit of a social networking addict on Facebook at a personal level, but also professionally, we're, we're learning a lot about how to basically get the word out. So we have a YouTube channel that my son is helping us develop and all that. So I'm, I'm learning in practical terms some things about essentially messaging and marketing. In um, uh, another, there's a couple of other things that we're looking at that we've discovered sort of or learned. One of them is what I think is a unique form of executive coaching. And a lot of my learning, I've, the last three years have been sort of research and development in this regard. But the idea is that most executive coaching seems to be broadly either trying to exec get an executive out of trouble because he yells at meetings or he's inappropriate or is sexual harasser, but we don't want to lose him or whatever it is. And I know colleagues that do that and it's kind of like behavior therapy. And then I also know, have a lot of colleagues who become to use a slightly cynical, but I think it's a real thing. We're rent of friends with a lot of business acumen to senior leaders. That is, let me ask some good questions to help you understand what your problem is. And then let me ask some core questions to help you figure out what your solution. And I think that's powerful stuff. And I, and there's a lot of programs and methodologies and literally tens of thousands of executive coaches. What we discovered when we were working with an organization of maybe six years ago was when we did a thing that we call the individual performance map or customer diagram, where we sit down with individuals as part of, usually as part of our analysis or coaching, where we say, okay, who do you deliver value to? And then what are the work outputs? Now, to get back to your thing about, you, you mentioned, you know, you can kick it or whatever. For us, work outputs are not just tangible things. They can also be things like relationships that I establish and develop. Um, they can be decisions. They can be recommendations. So, so we, we were doing, we were develop, delivering our coaching program to this mid-sized organization and the CEO got very interested in it. It was a not-for-profit. And she said, um, you know, my board is trying to measure my performance and they're coming up with all these wacky ideas. If you sat down and do a customer diagram with me or individual performance map, you think we could come up with some good stuff to measure? So at that time, my then partner was the, serving that client mostly and I was in the background. And what we started to see was that when you do that with a senior leader, First of all, there's a whole lot of stuff that isn't normally wouldn't get on the paper because for senior leaders, things like approvals, decisions, recommendations, goals, et cetera, are kind of, you know, they happen in meetings and conversations. But when you put those things down paper, you say, oh, and these have huge leverage and these are extremely important. And so that combined with some work we did with senior executives in Korea for about six or seven years, combined with some other C-level folks that I've been sort of experimenting with, we've learned that if you do that exercise with a senior leader, and then you start asking questions, once they've got sort of their whole map of their contributions, you say, well, what's the most important stuff? What's the most leverageable? Are there any things you could delegate? What do you spend your time on? How do the people who are receiving these decisions, recommendations, blah, 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 deal with it? What processes are you feeding your contributions into and how are those processes working? You can kind of deconstruct the organization from the top down in a way that's enormously clarifying to senior executives. So we're, we're gonna start certifying people to do that at some point, probably next year. 
but I'm learning a lot about what happens when you make accomplishments clear to people that they didn't even fully acknowledge in their own performance. So that's one. And then the other thing that's kind of another R&D thing is we've been asked for years to work with human resource business partners, HR business partners. And I've always thought that would be a great thing because they, they're working with managers and leaders. And so if you could bring them on board somehow, you got the organization wired, you could really drive performance improvement in a big way. But the problem is that people that have come to us have always said, well, can we put them in your performance, in your practitioner program? And it's like, no, because that's for big projects. And HR business partners are spread way too thin for that. They do a lot of stuff at once. So over the last year, one of my colleagues, Dr. Barbara Buckland and I have done some analysis and interviews with HR business partners, and we've developed a curriculum for them, which is more sort of small modules that apply what we know about performance improvement, but in a way that's useful, like better accomplishment-based job descriptions, execution of strategy, how to manage processes, how, a bunch of stuff that in smaller chunks can become part of how the HR business partners deliver value. And COVID-19 cut us off the knees there because we we're about ready to pilot this thing and we haven't yet. But I'm hoping over the next few months, we're gonna get a chance to kick that back in because I think there's a lot to learn about how people in that role can distribute performance improvement throughout an organization. So those are at least some of the things. And then speaking of writing, um, when Ogden Lindsley died, uh, which was about 16 years ago, at the Association for Behavior Analysis, which is my other kind of professional organization, we had a symposium with a bunch of us describing the contributions and our affection for Ogden. And, uh, you know, he was a very important person to me personally, as well as professionally. And so there was a book that's going to come out probably early next year of chapters from all those contributors and a few other people. So I struggled for years to think about what I could put in there because I've written about most of the stuff that I was said 16 years ago. And so I recently published, finished a manuscript that's going to be a chapter I'm really happy about. It's called uh, What My Father Taught, what, what I, what, what my father taught me, um, uh, recognizing the contributions of Ogden Lindsley, because he was essentially my professional father. And he taught me not only how to think from a sort of behavior science point of view, but there were also personal lessons. And for example, one of them happened at ISPI where uh, he and I did a presentation together. And that was kind of an honor for me, but because he was like one of my main mentors. And afterwards, we were going up the escalator and he, he started to say, you did very well in that Carl." And I started doing my, what then was my usual thing of, uh, yeah, but I could have done this better. And I didn't, uh, and he just looked me right in the eye. And he said, well, I'll use a swear word I would use, but he said, shut up and just say, thank you. And I went, Ooh, you know, and that changed my behavior for the rest of my life. Because what I realized was when you push back on people's compliments, it's really disrespectful to them, first of all. It's not very kind to them. They're saying a nice thing. You say, well, you're not. And secondly, you just let it in. And so anyway, I just finished this chapter a month or so ago, and I'm really happy about it because he taught me a lot of stuff, and I want to share that with people. So that's going to come out in a book in, sometime next year. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, he was a kind of a character, and I really admired him, and I wished I had more of a chance to uh, learn from him. So I'm looking forward to this book coming out. What was the name of it again? The book. Uh, I think it's, I don't remember the official name. It's coming from the Cambridge Center for Behavioral Studies, okay. Sloan Publishing, and I believe it will be called something like The Life and Contributions of Ogden R. Lindsley or something ah. like that, edited by Abigail Calkin. Uh, I'm sure that I'll post some stuff when it comes out so people know about it. Very cool. Let's talk a little bit about language. Um, I asked this question in these uh, interviews, is there a favorite or perhaps not so much a favorite performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Perhaps you feel it's being misused, misconstrued, um, but uh, what, what would you contribute here? Can I, can I talk about you two can do of them? Two. Yes. Okay. So accomplishments, we've already sort of talked about. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a really, really important word. And I think, I think Tom Gilbert selected the word effectively for sort of marketing because it sounds like something that's valuable, you know. 
but as we were speaking about earlier, I think that it's turned into sort of a mushy word. And so I've devoted a fair amount of the last 10 or 12 years to teaching people the difference between behavior and accomplishments. And I use the phrase now work outputs because I think it's countable products of behavior that actually deliver value to the organization. So I think that's an extremely important word, but I think as a field or as a community, a verbal community of people who use that word, we ought to be a little bit more self-reflective because sometimes it seems to mean organizational results. Sometimes it seems to mean changes of behavior. Sometimes it, it's hard to tell what it means. And so that's a word that I think is important, but should be used more precisely. And the other word, in my opinion, is a bad and destructive word, which is the word competencies, because um, where that came from historically, other than the academic background, was that people did, they were doing essentially best practices behavior analysis of leadership. And they came up with a very long list of behaviors that great leaders do, which is fine. It was like 125 or something like that. I don't remember the details, but that's too much to deal with. So they sorted them into categories, the piles and named the piles. And that's what became competencies. Now, what I believe is that competency models, which an enormous uh, companies have made millions and millions and millions of dollars, you know, let me show you our list and we'll tweak it for you. And that'll only cost you $300,000. I personally, I don't, blame anybody personally, but I think in effect, the competency modeling thing has become a kind of a scam. Because what I see is I work with trainers, I work, you know, and they say, well, we want to work with, you know, strategic agility is our objective. Like, what is that? You know, or even worse, in fact, my, my director of uh, major accounts, John Skank, who was a client of mine 30 years ago, when he was senior vice president of sales at Bradstreet, he talks about how, and I think it's a common practice, they had to you know, rate their people in competencies. And he said, well, well, you were told you couldn't have all fives, so you had to kind of adjust some of them down. It, it, has, it, it makes people think they're doing something with performance, but they're not. Because a competency is this broad category of behavior that looks completely different if you're doing, like I always think of communication, whatever, some people have phrased. Well, okay, but that behavior is pretty different if I'm negotiating a tough deal with somebody versus if I'm trying to develop a relationship with a new employee versus if I'm trying to sell something. Those are different er bits of behavior. And if we're going to just call them all communication, blah, 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 it's not helpful. So I, I get on, a, as you can tell, a little bit of a high horse about that one because what happens is we'll come into organizations and if they're really bought into and committed to competency modeling, it's almost an impenetrable thing. You cannot get them to behavior accomplishments because that like is not, doesn't fit their models. So fortunately, a lot of companies get that now. And uh, I've talked to more and more senior like CHROs and stuff in the last few years, where at least if I talk to them in private, they say, yeah, this competency thing is full of it, but we're trying to figure out the next thing. And what I think is the next thing is accomplishments. I think we can do all of that stuff with accomplishments, but we're just starting to work on it. You know? Yeah. Anyways, no, those are my two good, words. Good luck on that. I, and, uh, I, I like that uh, because the competencies have always bothered me. They're too general, generic, and yeah. you don't necessarily transfer to somebody else's processes. No. And especially when you're looking at what are the work outputs, you know, it's a means to the ends, and uh, just it's just too general. But uh, thank well, you. Well, and we have a place for them. We put them. Yeah. If you need to use competency models, we can put it in selection assignment. We can look, do it, put it in skills and knowledge. But you'll soon discover that it doesn't help much. So we hope it'll fade away. But if you have to use them, and I've like we do an annual summer institute where we gather about 50 people together and have a wonderful learning experience for several days. And the last one we did, I just these were my friends. So I did an emperor has no clothes thing. And I really did it a bit of a diatribe on competencies that the thing I just said makes it look mild, you know, mild by comparison. And there were a couple of people in, com in companies who were our colleagues and our clients who got pretty upset about it because there's a lot of politics. There's a lot of money. There's a lot of investment around it. And it's a hard thing to dislodge. So what I'm trying to do in some companies is create a sort of a parallel universe you can do your competency modeling, but let's see if we can be accomplishment-based and really make a difference. You know, and we'll see. <laughs> well, my next question we've kind of covered uh, fairly extensively. I wanted to explore some of the uh, people who've influenced you regarding your early practices. Um, 
And again, I was um, I wanted to pull this out uh, so that we can share this with others who want to develop themselves further in this whole world of performance improvement. And there's many means to that end, but um, um, so I guess this is the last shot here. I, I don't want to exhaust you uh, mentally from from uh, uh, trying to think of uh, who else you might add to the list, but 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 I'll but I'll open that up to you. Is there anybody else that you'd like to add? Well, those just tell a story. I've, me I've mentioned I've mentioned two people, but I think it's worth going into a little bit more detail, and that's Ogden Lindsay and Eric Cotton. Ogden was uh, well, Ogden was a character without a doubt. I mean, he. He flew bombers in the Second World War, and he escaped from German prison camps and a whole lot of stuff. But when he went to Harvard as a graduate student, um, he um, he didn't think he was going to study with Skinner. But then he just, he saw Skinner shaping the behavior of a rat and realized how powerful Skinner's technology and science was. So he wound up being Skinner's graduate student, and they started the first operant conditioning laboratory for humans at the Metropolitan State Hospital together. And Ogden published this enormous number of articles, which were just brilliant, precise behavior science, but applied to psychosis, communication and cooperation, um, advertising, uh, measure, some of the earliest behavioral pharmacology. And you can find most of those articles on fluency.org. And then, then what happened was in about late 19, middle 60s, he was drawn into education. And so he published an important work, uh, article in 64 called Direct Measurement and Prosthesis of Retarded Behavior. And then he moved to your alma mater, Kansas, where to use his Second World War uh, analogy, he described himself as parachuting behind enemy lines into the education world. And what he meant by that, really, beside the fact that the education establishment looked a little bit like the enemy of behavior science, um, what he meant was he was working with special and regular ed teachers who didn't know anything about behavior science. And so what he had to do was create a plain English vocabulary to communicate and enable people to apply Skinner science in the classroom, which he did, and it became the field of precision teaching. And so I met him in the early 70s, and he's, he's an outrageous character. He was a wonderful, you know, raconteur and all of that. And just strikingly brilliant and creative. But what? But in that thing of precision teaching, he really quit publishing a lot and he developed a kind of a human to human way of, of developing people so that um, it's much more of a communication from student to student or teacher to student, both with kids and also with, you know, those of us who were his protégés. So he was a huge influence on me in so many ways. And I've already mentioned him, but I really recommend anybody who wants to understand some of the science in precise terms that under, and especially around measurement, check out his stuff. And then Eric Houghton, who is far less understood. Eric was an early guy in behavior modification in Canada when in the six, early 60s. And then he went to Harvard for a while and worked with program instruction. And he did an incredible thing. He worked with this design guy, uh, what's his name, Loeb, his first name. But anyway, he created, he did program instruction without words. It was, a, it was teaching geometry without any verbal prompts or anything, which is kind of amazing. And um, he met Lindsley there and Skinner. And then uh, he became Skinner, one of Lindsley's first graduate students when he went to University of Kansas. And Eric started working with Ogden to take Skinner's measure, rate of response or behavior frequency, count per minute, into classrooms. And they made a whole lot of discoveries there. But what happened was in the late 60s, one of the things about Skinner's measure is it's, not, it's instead of just percent correct or accuracy, you're looking at the time dimension. So for example, if I gave you a piece of paper that had 100 simple addition problems on it, and I said, okay, please begin, take a minute and write as many answers as you could. You'd probably be someplace between 70 and 100 a minute. Maybe you'd be a little faster, but correct. You might make an error because you're moving really fast, but that's what it means to be competent at that skill. And most kids don't even get a chance to do that because nobody ever times them. And so if you can only do it 20 a minute, A, you're not going to remember it. And B, when I start throwing things like story problems at you, you're going to be screwed because the components are not fluent. So that was the first discovery that if we measure quote, academic or cognitive skills 
with the time dimension, we get a much more sensitive thing. And then the next thing that came out of that, which is really Eric's big contribution, and it's relevant to instructional designers, is that if you look at performance that isn't getting as quick as it should be, that maybe isn't up to speed in the call center yet in terms of calls per hour, let's say. If you look at it, what you'll find is that there's component, behavior components that are not fluent, that hold the whole thing down. So if you're, if you're a guitarist and you got some chord changes or some, some scales or whatever that aren't very good, even if everything else is good, that'll slow the whole thing down. So Eric wrote this paper in 1971 or two that you can find on fluency.org called Aims Growing and Sharing. And what he and Clay Starlin and a couple of their colleagues had discovered was, if you can identify these component behaviors, like with math skills, for example, it's not just addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, it's writing numbers, it's reading numbers. You should be able to read numbers at 100, 150, 200 a minute. If you can't do those things, it holds everything down. And so the notion of component analysis plus fluency measurement was a profound kind of contribution. And the whole field of precision teaching for the last 45 years has been about, especially with kids, figuring out those components. And that's what we did with, like going back to the customer service world, you know, one of the things we discovered, and you, I bet you you've been involved in call centers, right? You've done everything more or less, right? So in call centers, there's all kinds of content that people have to learn. And of course it would be good if it were fluent. But one of the things we observed there was the way people, most call center people have to use multiple systems, like an account, like a customer database, a product thing, maybe three or four different systems. And usually the way that's trained in my experience is something like a scavenger hunt, or they say, oh, take 20 minutes and find answers to this, but there's no time dimension usually. And what we found was and I think at AT&T Wireless, we published an article about this. I think it was the big factor. We created these exercises like, here's 20 questions. I'm gonna give you five minutes, you and your partner, your partner asks you the question, you see how fast you can find it. You keep practicing this stuff until you can find the information, enter the information, navigate the thing without even thinking. Once you do that, it lifts the whole ceiling. And so I think that's why we were able to get call center reps up to speed in two weeks instead of two months because the the system components were no longer an obstacle. And for me, at least, that goes back to, to Eric Houghton's contribution. So that's, I think, a big one. And most people are not even aware of him because he didn't publish that much. So all of this is on uh, uh, fluency.org. I'm going to put yeah. in the uh, YouTube video notes so that people mm -hmm. can follow up with that. But uh, that's uh, well. It's and as long as you're talking about references, there's two other URLs that are probably worth knowing. One is performancethinking.tv, which is our YouTube channel where we're talking about our current work in small bits. And it's starting to grow. And the other is sixboxes.com, where we have a resource library that we have a fair number of publications uh, about some of the work we've been doing and some white papers. As long as you're sharing information with people, those are two good things. Excellent. Yes, no, I will certainly include those. Well, Carl, thank you so much for participating uh, with me in this uh, second uh, video interview 10 years later. My, my final question to you is, do you have any parting words of wisdom uh, of, or guidance for our audience, especially those who are new to the field? What would you share with yes, them? Yes, I do. And it's partly based on what I described to you about Skinner, that I sent him a letter and he responded. What I believe is, and I say this to graduate students a lot too, a lot of graduate students say, what program, what university should I go to? They come to me about that. Or I have colleagues who say, you know, what, should, what training should I go to and stuff? And my view is that first of all, you should find people who are thought leaders or really good at something. And, the, and you know, like in a graduate program, you shouldn't just go to the University of X graduate program. You should see what professors there are publishing and doing stuff that's interesting to you and go find them. Because what I believe is that the most, the best learning is by seeking out mentors and being protégés. And so for example, I have almost never taken a course in human performance improvement or behavior science, but I aggressively sought out, you know, I was introduced to Skinner, Lindsley, Barrett, Houghton, Harless, Gilbert, Toasty, and I, and I, I would stick to those people like glue 
And so my general recommendation is if you want to know stuff, if you want to get good at stuff, go in whatever way you can and find those people and become their protégés no matter what it takes, whether it's telephone calls, like with Gary Rumler, we used to check in every month or so. And I would, you know, I just learned stuff from him. So I think that's the most important thing to say, learn from people who are no more than you do kind of, you know, and aggress. And all the other part of that is don't be afraid of it. Like I even do this with my son who's 23 now. It's like, no, you should contact them because people who know stuff love to share it usually with people who are interested. They'll love to do it. So go for it, you know, is kind of the message. Very good advice. Carl, again, thanks so much for doing this. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much.